Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a picture perfect day outside. I'm currently in my study overlooking the backyard. It's green and bright, and here in Adelaide, South Australia, where I live. And welcome to the first and hopefully one of many uh, astrobiological Facebook group uh, podcast, I guess you could call this. It's meant to be just uh, another forum for discussion, for expanding on uh, interesting posts and comments during the week or discussing news related to our, our core topics of interest. Um, we can uh, praise contributions from um, people who've given something to the group during the week. It'll hopefully be run on a weekly basis. Um, as I said, my name is Ben. I'm the, I run this group. And thank you to all who've been part of it so far. I've gotten a lot out of it, and I hope you are too so far. It's only been uh, going for a, about a month, and up to 134 members, so that's great. I'm really flattered by that. Small but growing. Uh, so if you want to find more members who may be interested in something like this, uh, grab them and rope them in. Go right ahead. First, we'll, we'll start with one order of business. Um, astrobiological, uh, as you can probably guess by its name, has a core topic and that is astrobiology. And a one sentence definition of astrobiology is it is the study of life on other worlds or possibility thereof. It um, covers a wide range of scientific disciplines and whatnot. Uh, there's lots, so there's lots of room for speculation and what if type questions. You can let your mind wander a bit when you're thinking about uh, astrobiology. I do. I'm not going to lie. That's just how I am. Um, but try to keep posts fairly on topic. Um, I've not approved posts yet from a member who is putting up some soccer-related posts, which you know I appreciate the fact that um, people have other interests. But um, this group will become something that's not supposed to be if people just put up anything they want. That's what Facebook is for. Uh, these kind of groups are for people who have a particular common interest. So, yep, having said that, um, science fiction is welcome here or other scientifically related topics that are that can be linked to astrobiology or astronomy, whatnot. I myself occasionally wander, but they don't go too far. So, yeah. Having said, a science fiction is welcome here. We have uh, several Expanse fans who are part of the group. Um, that's a cool show. Very cool show. It's one of my favourites. I've watched both seasons. I love them. Um, my favourite character so far is, well, no longer because he's gone, is, uh, spoiler alert, is Miller. Don't know. He was just a cool character. So who's your favourite character? Why? Um, put up a post about this or comments somewhere on the group. I would love to see it. So, um, that's an order of business out of the way. Right, so the group, it's doing pretty well. If we look at insights, uh, 58 new members in the last 28 days, um, 405 post comments and reactions in the last 28 days, and people are contributing, which I'm really pleased about. Now I'm gonna outline some top posts, or top posters or contributors. And these aren't in any kind of a order of preference or importance or relevance or whatever. I've just randomly picked these names out of a hat and written them down on a little sheet of paper here. That's it right there, if you can see it. Okay, beginning with uh, Lantel Subornal. I apologise if I've uh, mispronounced your name. Uh, currently resides in New Zealand. Is a member of um, the New Zealand Astrophotographers Facebook group and other groups. Um, he's interested in the stars, of course and has been a meaningful member of this group since its inception pretty much. So thank you to Lane Tell. A lot of posts from him. Bruce Dormanay, a science journalist and contributor to uh, publications such as Forbes, who has recently attended the International Astronomical Union's Astrobiology 2017 conference and put up a whole pile of interesting stuff along the way. Thank you to Bruce. He's got... Um, 
he's put a, a lot of interesting posts. So check so check out his uh, what he's got to add, what to say. Anton Kronishny, a uh, teacher from the Ukraine. He's um he's been great as well. Thank you, Anton, for a few discussions along the way. That's what it's all about, far as I'm concerned. Clayton Bell uh, put up a great post a little while back, uh, challenging us to imagine the computers used by aliens who don't rely on sight like us. Now this has got me thinking. We had a chat about it, so that was fantastic. Thank you, Clayton. I'm going to mispronounce this person's name, Claude Doudna. Doudna. Uh, a lot of shares and comments. Um, now he often uh, gives contrasting uh, points of view to what I put up, and that's fine. That's what science is all about. One, the one common mantra of science that uh, is often overlooked is never say never. You can't just declare something to be fact because there's always, there's always some kind of exception to the rule. So, Claude, thank you for um, providing uh, alternate points of view. That's that's fine by me. Uh, Mario Olkers, a lot of shares in my posts, so thank you very much. You're getting the uh, group noticed and contributing to the discussion in that way by getting people thinking. Belinda Rovcorn uh, in the last 24 hours. She hasn't come up in the group insights, I'm sorry, but she's there. Posted two great videos, uh, which are worth checking out. So thank you very much to Belinda. And I'll end this little section with, I love yous all. Okay, so moving on. What's been happening in the group this week? Uh, for those who are keeping track of what I do, I run a YouTube channel called Astrobiological. Uh, it's only small, but that's okay. Um, I, I put up videos once every couple of weeks, or up between every couple of weeks and a month. They're a little bit regular, but uh, I'm just a one-man band, so that's what I, what I, all I can do. And um, the groups, this post, Facebook group's purpose is partly to promote that channel, but not entirely. So I'm having a lot of fun just uh, talking to people about other things, not entirely related to the channel. I'm working on a video at the moment about the about a, a system of planets of seven planets orbiting the red dwarf star Trappist One, which lies 39 light years away from Earth. Uh, it was discovered in 2011 initially, but a system of seven planets was found to be orbiting it, I believe, last year or 2015. That may be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. And they have been loosely classed as. Uh, Earth-like, which could mean Earth-size, Earth-like. Now, it's highly unlikely that they are just like us, with trees and birds and oceans and things, but you never know. So they're a hot topic of study at the moment, and my video will be exploring that system. So I hope you like that. Um, many more posts in the way as well. I put up a little video last night um, advertising the that impending work. So, moving on. Okay, now the group has been busy, and again, thank you to contributors, um, you're great. Um, I also work on a blog as well called called Ben's Lab. Ben's Lab was initially the name of my YouTube channel, but I rebranded it a bit, trying to, um, I guess, declutter, declutter the look and feel of the channel a bit, and focusing more on astrobiology and related stuff. That's why I started this group and other things. Yeah, this group is also linked to a, a Facebook page called Ben's Lab. I haven't changed the name of that. I'm not going to. There's a few thousand members there who mostly hail from uh, Southeast Asia or India and Indonesia. So, yeah, uh, the group's are linked. So I'm not sure how this works entirely, but I guess it basically means that what I, anything I put up in the group will come up on that page as well and vice versa. So, yeah, you can cross-share or cross-post or whatnot. I don't know what the term is. I'm not a social media guru just yet. Or maybe ever, but hey. I'm having fun trying. Okay. Yeah. One thing it will bring up, uh, a highlight post from the last week uh, by Bruce Dormany, whom, whom I mentioned before. Um, put up a fantastic post um, asking the question, are dying carbon stars the ultimate source of our DNA? Um, just read it for yourself and... It's one of, those, one of those posts that really makes you think so. Because traditionally it's been thought that now, now the precursors of DNA and proteins form readily in space. We've we've seen that in action. 
the molecular clouds and whatnot, and in the depths of interstellar space. But at the end of the day, it's too cold for much to happen chemically out there. So this this article flows the idea that perhaps uh, in the dying stages, a star has produces heavy elements, um, and there's more heat and whatnot going on out there, not within the star itself, but around it, but nearby. Um, to, be, to produce these precursor compounds which then make their way to Earth via the process of uh, panspermia or lithopanspermia. Uh, if you want to know what panspermia is, it's uh, an old concept uh, theory uh, which holds that life as it applies to Earth may have, applied, may have arrived here after, being, after the precursors were brought here billions of years ago by comets or asteroids. Um, delivered here in impacts and along with a lot of water so sounds entirely reasonable to me it could have been reversed why not i've done some videos exploring that as well and i'll probably be doing more later on so stay tuned all right moving on now this uh blog of mine that i mentioned i thought i'd just read out a couple of posts today like little mini audio books i guess so let's try that out First one was called Sons of War, The View from Phobos. Uh, because uh, a few months ago I was interested in the Martian moons and I thought I'd do a post about them. So here they are. And this, this uh, post was actually liked by the, uh, the Japanese space agency JAXA. Uh, so I was quite chuffed about that. So I'll just read it out for you. That's, that's all I can do, really. I can't give you any visual special effects or anything, but uh, let's go. Sons of War, the view from Phobos. Uh, enter spacey music. Okay. The crackling airways reverberate with the ethereal radio noise of the universe. You're sitting cross legged in a fine regolith, stud staring out into the big empty. You reach down and tune your receiver on your spacesuit, trying to lock in some broadcasts from Mars. It's pretty quiet down there today. Traffic is slow. There sure as hell isn't too much happening here today. Not even commercial vessels hover over the skyline of this tiny moon. Phobos is alone with his thoughts on this Martian soul, and so are you. It's a good place to get away. When you're after some quiet time, you don't mess around. Mars is a hub of busy busy. As a melting pot of factions, corporate, government and private explore and cover it up, maps are being drawn down there, maps of the future. Mars rolls slowly beneath you. Phobos' orbit brings it close to the red planet. With a semi-major axis of 9,377 kilometers, Phobos makes a closer approach to its parent body than any other satellite or moon in the solar system. By contrast, Phobos' little brother Deimos has a semi-major axis of 23,460 kilometers. If you are standing on the surface of Mars, you might just see Deimos as a point of light, something like the folks back on Earth see Venus in the morning and at dusk. So why Sons of War? Why indeed? Asaf Hall, who inadvertently discovered the pair in 1877 after some pushing from his wife, after which Stickney Crater was named, had a penchant for ancient Greece it seems. Phobos and Deimos were the sons of the Greek god of war, Ares, Mars to the Romans. Phobos means panic and Deimos means fear. They sounded like a handful for their old man. The universe is a gift. What else can it be? Every single day seems to bring something new and completely interesting. Sometimes you need to hunt for it, and sometimes it's right there, hiding in plain sight. You'd be known to have a fascination with the phenomenon. You never thought setting up here in this nondescript pile of rubble could be so interesting. All alone with this incredible vista, you look down at Mars and think about tossing your tickets back home out into space. It wouldn't take much. Here in Phobos, you are your own launch system. Phobos is the ultimate destination for weight loss. Back on Earth, you weigh in at just over 100 kilograms. Here in this tiny little rock, you weigh just over 60 grams. And that's right, you and your little sister's black and white kitten weigh the same right now. It does make going for a walk tricky though. In the first few years of the Great Mars Rush, Phobos was a hot spot. Stickney Crater, that six mile wide base and swallowing up one end of the moon, became an overnight spaceport, with Hamer Station becoming a sprawl of impossible architecture in a couple of years. People being what they are, they didn't really look before they leapt, literally. 
rescuing floating space tourists who become new Martian moons of tripping over a piece of regolith became a profitable cottage industry. Magnetic birds won't work up here, of course. The terrain is almost entirely regolith, powdered rock formed by millennia of impacts. In fact, gravity is so low that with every step you carefully take, a cloud of dust slowly puffs up, taking several minutes to descend back to the ground behind you. You're holding onto a handrail, one of several hundred which stretch for collectively dozens of miles around the moon. These handrails were the workaround some bright spark came up with in the early days. Straight out of an OHS manual, these rails are pretty much all that keeps you from launching yourself into the big empty. Because gravity is so light, you can't really feel the terrain. Probably if you weighed your actual 100 kilos, you'd sink into the several metres of regolith beneath you. It'd be like dry quicksand. Beneath all that it voids, a handy feature of the moon. Phobos is about one third empty space. It's a feature of the moon's formation. Back when Mars was in its infancy, something huge crashed into it, like an interplanetary T-Rex. A lot of Mars was kicked up in space, forming a secondary cloud of dust and rock around what was left of it. Some of this matter clumped and glommed together under gravity's inexorable pull and moons formed. Phobos and Deimos are the last survivors of these Martian offspring. They are piles of rubble. Imagine you're an extra in a, in a disaster movie where a building has collapsed on your head and you play a survivor, trapped in the rubble. All the bits of the building don't fall down in an orderly manner. This would be an entirely different universe if they did. Just imagine physics lessons. Anyway, survivors trapped under fallen rubble. Girders, chunks of concrete and twisted metal have fallen randomly, strewn in a completely chaotic heap of mess, under which our film extras wait for the heroic star to pull them out. Phobos is like this. Chunks of randomly shaped Mars have simply fallen together, resulting in an odd honeycomb of dark empty caverns and spaces, which are now used by humanity, which is rapidly filling them up with the detritus of colonization industry, even living quarters. Like some bizarre sentient ant colony, humans hide on the ground here. It's a refuge from some crazy space radiation, the same as that bombarding and frying electronics down on Mars. Mars is virtually zipping past. Formos has an extremely fast orbit. Right now, you are sailing around the red planet, completing an orbit in just over 7 hours. Deimos, all alone out there, lags behind, making the journey in just over 30 hours. You're holding the handrail tight, but part of you wants to let go, to reach out for the red planet. It really is moving fast, and that humanity is here. To paraphrase Kim Stanley Robinson, once Mars was a dream, now it was a place. So there you go, that's my Phobos post. I uh, was quite proud of that one, and some people like to say it. And now let's uh, that post over. What do you think? Tell me. All opinions welcome. Just keep it fairly nice if you can. Where's my coffee? No. Damn. You know what I hate about coffee? It's all gone. So we look at today. We've done intro intros to myself and the group. Um, I've. Highlighted some members for the week. Uh, and great job again to those people who are contributing to the group and taking part, helping it become something fun. Uh, I'm probably going to put this podcast up on YouTube as well, but it's mainly uh, for this group. This group is my first love at the moment, so thank you to all who are helping me out while making it happen. Uh, orders of business we've done stay roughly on topic yep that's like I say I'm not uh, I don't uh, I respect everyone's right to their own interest but yeah this group has a core set of interests so yeah just try and stick fairly closely to that the stuff that's gone up so far is is pretty good so good job everyone um, some expanse discussion I talked about that uh, favourite character very brief discussion. Uh, mine is Miller. Who is yours? And why? Feel free to post away. I did a blog post reading. I may do another blog post reading right now. Let's have to update that post because I accidentally edited it while I was reading it. I'm reading off my computer screen from WordPress. Right, it's updating. Just give me a second. Some brief thinking music. Right, let's go. Update it. What 
we'll make another interesting post. We've done Sons of War. Metal Core. This was the this post was almost directly inspired by the expanse, I've got to say, so let's read this one out. Right. It was called Metal Core Walking on 16 Psyche. I've done uh, my last video was on 16 Psyche, so check that out. I'll put a link up to it on the page, but it's on my YouTube channel as well, of course. Uh, so let's start this reading. Okay, now while I was writing, I had a soundtrack in my head because the name Metal Core uh, drifts of metal music. So, a soundtrack, a mental soundtrack to this post. Anything that makes you bleed out of your ears. So, take your pick. Right, and we're off. The horizon is small. It always feels weird when you see it curving away unnaturally the way it does. Of course, this chunk of nowhere you're on is a little smaller than home on Mars, even though random tourists from Earth are full of oohs and ahs at Red Planet's horizons. 16 Psyche. Take a security job there, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Guard the most precious hunk of metal in the solar system. An asteroid over 200 kilometers in diameter, composed almost entirely of iron and nickel. Over 10,000 quadrillion dollars worth. This place could smash the US economy to smithereens. Easily. Now, a lot of other places in the solar system have a certain fiduciary value. Asteroid mining has been big biz for a long time now. Your grandparents were among the first belt miners heading out from Hamer Station on Phobos. But 16 Psyche is the jewel in the crown. This chunk of metal comprises nearly 1% of the asteroid belt. Like all gold rushes, there's naturally a lot of interest, to put it diplomatically. We're here to take care of folks who get a little bit too interested. This place sure gets boring though. Most security is automated these days. Fleets of weaponized drones orbit the moon, keeping a watchful eye out for unwanted visitors. Space piracy is much like Star Wars. Space is way too dangerous and chaotic for that. No, in this day and age, anyone wanting a piece of this prize has to be organized to the 14th decimal place. They need to know what they're doing, and they need lots of, lots of money behind them. Like the privateers of old, the only pirates these days are on government or corporate payrolls, mainly out to disrupt things. Occasionally, they head out here and make pains in the arse of themselves, but that's about all they really do. The real wars of territory take place in boardrooms across the solar system. You don't really care about all that. The view here is incredible. You're walking on the core of a protoplanet. This place was named Psyche after the Greek word for soul. Walking on this bare expanse of metal, it seems fitting this is that this exposed core is a window into the soul of the dead world. The gravity on these tiny bodies always messes with you. On Phobos, you weigh about 70 grams. Here, you're the same weight as a small cat. You think back to your time on the tiny Martian moon. Handrails everywhere. The moon was covered with them like chain mail. Too easy to trip over a rock and become an unofficial new moon of the red planet. Who was that guy working on a sticking crater? He had a good operation going. A small fleet of drones patrolling the space around Phobos. Plucking over-enthusiastic hikers from Martian orbit. You've forgotten his name. Who cares anyway? Here on 16 Psyche, the handrails aren't a big deal. The whole asteroid is metal, right? Iron for the most part. Taking a walk across the metal fissures and canyons is simple. No engineering, no engineering expertise needed. Just magnetic boots. Break time. You squat down in a dark crack in the surface and log off for a bit. This asteroid lies roughly three astronomical units, or AU, from the sun. An AU is roughly 93 million kilometers, the distance at which Earth lies from the sun. 16 Psyche spins slowly, so being told. With only the Milky Way up there, you can't really tell. There's been a bit of activity today. A few unmarked ships have come a little close. One even buzzed the extraction facility over at J Gorge. It's a low-G quarry, basically. The drill broke down, a monster to mine us all out of J called Grindstein. Built on Earth decades ago, Grindstein saw service on Mars and the Moon, carving cities out of the regolith. Now it's here, taking tiny nibbles out of the most valuable chunk of metal anywhere. The broken drill has sabotaged, someone said. Economic rivals want this place, and they'll steal all sorts of tricks to disrupt things any way they can. You still don't really care. You really came here because it's not every day you get to walk on the core of a planet. 16 Psyche is a battle-scarred veteran of the very earliest eons of the solar system. Once, it was a newly minted protoplanet, now a remnant. This place dodged other large forming bodies and chunks of debris, orbiting a 10 million year old sun. The night sky looked very different then, I'm guessing. The solar system was a coalescing mess of rocks, ice and organic muck. Everything was colliding and jostling. 
16 Psyche's outer layers were destroyed, torn away by up to 8 impacts with other large bodies. Whew, imagine that. Rough childhood. Maybe this nugget represents what Earth may have ended up looking like. Had Jupiter not scooped up rogue planetesimals terrorizing the inner solar system during the late heavy bombardment. So where did all that outer shell go? You wonder sometimes. This place took a beating for sure. Now this frozen little nugget is all just left. Old NASA sent a mission here way back in the 2020s, sending back pictures of a crackled metal hulk. Not all of the outer mantle was stripped away. About 10% of the surface is silicate rock. No different to anywhere on Mars, Earth, Venus or Mercury. That thin, th that thin veneer was once the mantle and crust of a planet that no longer exists. Science began taking a backseat to big business sometime after that NASA mission arrived. So the one and only scientific mission to 16 Psyche couldn't turn up much. But big business was more motivated. All the big players headed out there to slap their dollars, rubles, renminbi or rupees down on the table. There were even people sent here. There's only so much automation you can do. Tunnels were dug into the asteroid and human beings finally journeyed to the centre of the Earth, in a sense. Jules Verne would have been proud. The first tunnel into the core of this core was actually called Verne Tunnel. That's my post. I hope you enjoyed this little trip into the future. 16 Psyche is just one of a number of bizarre places in the solar system that are worth a tale. There are several other places I plan on visiting in future posts. Tell me what you think. Ben. That's the post. Hope you liked that one. Those two are probably my, some of my favourites out of the, the uh, blog posts I've written. Um, yeah. I can write when I can. Don't get as much time as I'd like to, but I still, I still uh, enjoy it. If anyone else has uh, blogs or projects that they'd like to share, uh, feel free to do so on this group. I don't mind. Uh, that's what it's all about. Sharing our achievements and just getting together and talking about stuff. It's kind of like a hangout, really. Right, so, again, to recap what we've done today, intros to myself and the group. Uh, the group, talking about how, where the group's at and where it's going. Good job, everyone. Top post contributors. Uh, everyone I mentioned, uh, thank you very much. I love his all order of business, yep. Okay, that's been done. Stay on topic uh, as much as you can, within reason. Uh, what we do, what we talk about here, some brief diversions into The Expanse. The TV show, not the books. I've started reading the books. First book. Uh, liking it. But anyway, it's mainly the TV show. Um, yeah, and a couple of blog posts reading. So I'll leave it at that for now. And I hope you enjoy being part of this group. I hope you enjoy this first little podcast. Tell me what you think. Do I mumble? Do I talk too fast? Um, or any other points you'd like to make. Um, I'll post this on YouTube and maybe some other... Um, locations on the uh, interwebs but we'll see how we go so astrobiological bringing you the universe in plain human catch you later